Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. Today I want to focus on the topic of managing genitourinary syndrome of menopause or GSM in breast cancer survivors and women at high risk. The information is based on the 2018 consensus recommendation on the management of GSM in women with breast cancer or high risk published by the North American Menopause Society and the International Society for the Study of Women's Sexual Health. To learn more about GSM and its diagnosis, you can tune in to this video. GSM is a constellation of physical changes and symptoms, including vulval vaginal dryness, burning or irritation, dyspareunia, and urinary symptoms of urgency, dysuria, or recurrent urinary tract infections associated with estrogen deficiency. More than 1 million women are living with gynecological cancer and more than 3 million are living with breast cancer in the US. Nearly 90% of survivors note sexual health as a major concern. This also includes survivorship from other cancers that involve the pelvic floor, such as the colon and rectal cancers. Many of the treatments, chemotherapy, radiation to pelvic area, and endocrine therapies increase the risk of GSM, especially for postmenopausal women who may already be experiencing them. For premenopausal women who require removal of their ovaries, they go into early menopause with a risk of also experiencing GSM. Hormonal therapy to treat breast cancer can also affect sexuality. The data on survivorship in Hong Kong and China is underreported, but in a 2011 analysis, there is an increasing incidence of breast cancer, especially in younger women, and also a higher five-year survival rate of 85.2% with mortality continuing to decrease. A chart review of over 800 women from a breast cancer survivorship clinic at a major national center found that only 39.8% of the 279 women with documented GSM received treatment. You can quickly see challenges to sexual health affects a significant number of cancer survivors and the management of GSM is critical for quality of life. So what are the recommendations? Non-hormonal therapies such as vaginal lubricants, moisturizers, pelvic floor therapies, and dilator therapies can be considered as first line. Lubricants should have an osmolality of less than 1,200 milliosmoles per kilogram to avoid mucosal irritation. And pH levels of the products should be between 3.8 to 4.5, with levels less than 3 considered unacceptable. Additives such as warming properties, flavors, and spermicides should also be avoided as they may irritate vaginal and vulvular tissues. Hyaluronic acid gel has been associated with reduced symptoms of vaginal dryness in women with breast cancer. Lubricants are used on an as-needed basis, and vaginal moisturizers are used regularly, and combinations of these can also benefit. Pelvic floor therapy with a trained physical therapist and managing pelvic floor disorders is recommended to reduce pain with vaginal penetration and may also help with the direction of vaginal dilator therapy. Counseling or sex therapy with a qualified professional may benefit women experiencing dyspareunia or relationship difficulties. There's another non-hormonal treatment for GSM in the form of topical lidocaine. An RCT of 4% aqueous lidocaine, which is a topical anesthetic applied three minutes prior to penetration, was associated with an 88% reduction in dyspareunia versus 33% in placebo. It is recommended that male partners use a condom. Next up, lasers and energy-based devices in breast cancer survivors. The FDA has approved laser therapy for dental, eye, and cosmetic procedures with data suggesting that lasers induce improvement in vaginal epithelium by promoting new collagen production, tissue integrity, and elasticity. In short, CO2 laser or the non-ablative vaginal erbium YAG laser may offer some options. More research is needed for the optimal number of cycles, retreatment time, and RCTs with long-term safety data on breast cancer survivors are also needed. So far, a 2024 comparison of vaginal estrogen compared to radiofrequency and CO2 laser in breast cancer survivors on adjuvant therapy show improvement in symptoms with all the above modalities of treatment. 
but there were no histological improvements found. In this study, the baseline vaginal atrophic changes was only identified in 60% of participants. This isn't a surprise finding, as vaginal changes do not always correlate with symptoms. One RCT in breast cancer survivors compared CO2 to sham laser for sexual function and did not find any differences. Another RCT comparing radio frequency with a vaginal gel also didn't show any difference. In studies where positive results with lasers or energy-based devices were reported, these lacked a comparison group and blinding. This also includes studies for managing urinary incontinence in menopausal women. No adverse effects were reported in these studies, so energy-based devices may be a viable option for a specific group of breast cancer survivors. What about women who do not respond to non-hormonal therapies? There are no FDA-approved hormone therapies for treatment of GSM in breast cancer survivors, and the use of systemic hormone therapy is contraindicated, and the clinical consensus also recommends against the use of systemic hormone therapy. However, the use of local vaginal estrogen after discussion of the risk and benefits with a women's oncologist may be considered. What's the difference between systemic and local vaginal estrogen? Systemic hormone therapy is for the treatment of whole body symptoms of menopause such as bothersome hot flashes and night sweats, also known as vatomotor symptom, and for the treatment of osteoporosis. Whereas local vaginal estrogen is used for management of GSM. You can learn more about it in this video. Factors to consider in breast cancer survivors are the hormone receptor status, recurrence risk, the type of anti-estrogen therapy, time since diagnosis, and quality of life. A shared decision-making with her breast oncologist is critical, as there are still gaps in research. For example, clinical trials of local estrogen in survivors of breast cancer are limited by small sample sizes and RCT data. But observational studies have suggested relative safety of local vaginal estrogen. It is recommended that estrogen should be applied to the lower one-third of the vagina due to the vascular connection with the uterus in the upper vagina with potential for greater systemic absorption. Consensus opinion assumes less systemic absorption confers lower risk for recurrence. Systemic absorption for local estrogen varies by active ingredient. The most potent is conjugated equine estrogen or CEE followed by estradiol then estriol, and also by the amount of active ingredient. For example, creams can be applied to a larger surface area and are more readily absorbed than vaginal tablets or rings. What about vaginal DHEA? Are they safer? In short, the FDA has not approved DHEA for use in cancer survivors. More research is needed. Side note, how does vaginal DHEA work? Well, there are no DHEA receptors in the genitourinary tissues. However, a mechanism known as intrachronology leads to the aromatization of DHEA to estrogen at the local cellular level, resulting in tissue effects, with subsequent inactivation of the hormones leading to minimal active hormone release into the systemic circulation. Apart from relieving symptoms, DHEA increased mucification of the epithelium, muscularis thickness, and collagen fiber compactness. All three layers of the vaginal wall are affected with a robust local physiological response. An RCT of 464 breast and gynecological cancer survivors experiencing GSM were given either 3.25 mg, 6.5 mg, or a plain moisturizer for 12 weeks. All three arms improved, but the women who used 6.5 mg reported significant improvement in sexual health. However, there was a significant increase in serum DHEAS, testosterone, and estradiol levels, so more studies are needed for long-term safety. Additional studies are also needed to compare it with other vaginal estrogens. A note about vaginal testosterone. Vaginal testosterone is considered off-label for GSM in non-breast cancer patients, and there are no approved products. A small RCT of 80 postmenopausal women without breast cancer who received compounded testosterone did find improvement in vaginal pH and vaginal flora. A few studies also looked at this in breast cancer patients. 
However, the serum testosterone levels were not fully described or had high levels beyond the normal physiological range, with one study reporting 12% of patients with elevated levels. This is why vaginal testosterone is not routinely recommended. Finally, neither oral forms of GSM therapies such as ospemaphine or tibolone are indicated in breast cancer survivors. So how about women at high risk of breast cancer? Since 75% of breast cancers are hormone sensitive, it is reasonable that women at high risk, meaning those with a first degree relative or a biopsy confirmed high risk lesion, and their doctors are apprehensive about using local vaginal estrogen. In brief, data suggests that systemic hormone therapy does not increase the risk of invasive breast cancer, and it is plausible that local low-dose vaginal estrogen with less systemic absorption should not elevate the risk of breast cancer. However, oral ospemaphine and vaginal DHEA have not been studied in high-risk women. In summary, current guidelines recommend non-hormonal therapies as first-line treatment for breast cancer survivors. But if these options do not sufficiently relieve symptoms, local vaginal estrogen may be considered cautiously with informed shared decision-making with their oncologists. The discussion and management can be complex, and a multidisciplinary approach is essential for improving quality of life for breast cancer survivors living with GSM. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell for future updates. If you have any questions or would like to hear about a specific topic, please comment below. See you in the next video.